And this is episode 169 of That Shakespeare Life. Welcome to this week's episode of That Shakespeare Life. I'm Cassidy Cash, and this is the show where we go behind the curtain and into the real life and history of William Shakespeare. This week, we're taking a look at Tudor history, specifically what Shakespeare would have worn as underwear. We're talking with our guest, Bess Chilver. Portraits of ladies and gentlemen from the 16th century show men and women adorned in all manner of finery, including everything from flowing gowns to magnificent swords and even those infamous Tudor rough collars. But what exactly did it take to create this look? What went under all of these clothes to make them stand out and poof up and look the way that we think of these iconic portraits? When Shakespeare surveyed his closet in the morning before he got dressed for the day, were there certain items of clothing he needed, like an undershirt or a pair of socks? This week, we're going to find out by diving into the world of early modern clothing to take a look at what Shakespeare and his contemporaries, along with his female counterparts, would have worn under their clothes. Our guest this week is Tudor clothier and historical costumer Bess Chilver, who joins us to answer questions, some of which have been submitted by members here at That Shakespeare Life, about what kind of underwear there would have been for people in turn of the 17th century England, including underwear, support garments, apparel needed for wigs, socks, and more. Bess Chilver is a historical costumer and professional tailor specializing in the 16th century Tudor clothing. Bess has attended the award-winning Great Recreations of Tudor Life at Kentwell Hall in Suffolk, England, where she created her own gentry gown for 1593, along with several other creations specific to the 16th century. She frequently partners with other historical costumers to test period patterns and has been published extensively on the history of Tudor dress and costume. Find out more about Bess in the show notes for today's episode. Hello, Bess. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Cassie, and thank you for inviting me. When Shakespeare was at home, would he have had a closet or a dresser that he kept his clothes in? I like to think of Shakespeare having a sock drawer, but was that how Elizabethan England stored their daily clothes? I just love the idea of a sock drawer, though I I love looking at um, historical and antique furniture. And from what my little bit of research is we don't have sock drawers unfortunately in the 16th century but what we do have are wooden chests they're called linen chests and they can be decorative or they can be fairly plain they're often lockable and they're portable relatively speaking because they're made of wood but this is where we they kept all their garments doesn't matter what type their garments would be kept in these linen chests and a bit later on we start getting more of like a cupboard um, called a linen press, and that's starting to come in early 17th century. The sock drawers, probably not until a bit like later. What was the standard underclothing for a man of Shakespeare's station to use for daily wear? So we have just effectively two layers, um, just for the underwear only. And this is the linen shirt, and I have one I can show you if you like. Absolutely, yes, let's see that. So this is a, a very basic simple man's shirt then you've got the cuff there and this is made of a fairly firm linen so it's perfect for a working class man up to middling shakespeare could have worn something like this for more heavy work if he doesn't want to be looked for too fancy and this one's got a very small standing collar and it's got ties then to actually tie around the neck and the cuffs as well match and if you're really working, really poor working in the fields, you probably don't have the cuffs and you probably don't have the collar because it's much easier to take it on and off and less well, in the way my, of... Well, that was my thought with the with the cuffs and the collar. Those stick out from underneath your, your clothes, I suppose. So yes. they, would, they would kind of identify you as fancier yeah. or less fancy depending on which one you had. Yes. But why did different stations have different kinds of undershirts if it's all going underneath anyway? Nobody's going to see it. You want to show yourself as being really wealthy and the, the fabrics, the linens 
these are come in a very big range of quality. So you can get the finest linens, which are almost, almost transparent, almost transparent. Um, and those are so expensive. And they're embroidered. They get embroidered. They get lace added to them. They get frills added to them. And that is the little bit which sticks out above your shirt, your, your doublet, outside of your cuffs and shows your wealth. So men wore this kind of undershirt. What about women of Shakespeare Station? Did they also have an undershirt? They had a smock. Um, so the men's stops round about the thigh, um, upper thigh, whereas women's will actually go all the way down to the calf. I, I don't have one with me at the moment because that's one of the ones I couldn't find <laughs> in, in my big storage space. Um, they are cut with um, extra fabric in the sides, roughly from just above the waist down to the hem, what's called gauze. They're a triangle of fabric inserted into the rectangular pieces for the front and back. And this allows you to walk easily without getting tangled up in the fabric because this is right up against the legs. Um, and just like the men's, they can be made of the finest of linens or more hard wearing. The slight difference is you can have them as a square neck or you can have them as the high neck, just like the men. And again, they're embroidered. They've got lace on them. Absolutely exquisite. One day I'll make one with embroidery on again. <laughs> These items seem like quite a bit of clothing just for the undergarment. Certainly a lot of work. Would individuals yeah. get dressed themselves? Or when you had all of this accoutrement going on, did you need someone to help you get dressed? So people um, are usually living in a household. Um, where there's going to be other people around. Even if you're fairly poor and you don't have servants or someone to help you, like an apprentice or something like that, you are likely to have other family members there and you'll be all helping each other. A husband in a working class household will probably help his wife to dress. However, you can actually dress yourself because I've done it. I've actually dressed myself in full gentry outfit all on my own. As long as the fastings at the front, I can do it. If it's at the back... <laughs> then it becomes a bit more of a problem. That's when it gets tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to ask you about support garments. I know women today, for example, wear a bra and, and women and men have the option of a jock strap. Without going into too much detail about the habits of today, rather, I want to ask you if there are similar items of support used in Shakespeare's lifetime as part of what we'd consider undergarments. So this is going to be a little bit longish um, because there's um, it's there's two different types for women, and we are we're going to be focusing on mostly on the women and upper class. So um, the first one is what's called an upper body petticoat, and I have one of those right here. Oh, exciting! So this is my own one. Now you said and your own. Did you make this? Yep, yeah, I made this myself. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay. Um, and this one's side laced and I can still get into it on my own. Not a problem. As long as the lacings are long enough that they're kind of fully laced in, um, I can get into it and then pull the laces down because it'll, it'll finish at the bottom where the eyelets are, and tiny little eyelets. It. Okay. And then I just pull it and then it'll tighten up as I need and I adjust myself as I want. And then there's a skirt which is made of a very, very firm wool. Um, and gravity helps pull this down and keep it fitted around the torso. Where it's supposed to go. Okay. This fits right on the waist. It's natural waist. And this one does have bones in it, but they are tiny, tiny, narrow reed bones. And the whole construction of it is made to fit me and me only. And it supports my bust and my back. And, and that's, I can that's work period specific i mean people would have their clothes yes. made specifically for them yes they okay. would there's no mass production at that time um people will go to a tailor to get these these sort of garments made um and that i can wear and have worn underneath my kirtle layer which is the bit everybody sees um in a kitchen working and walking all day on flagstone floors and lifting very, very, very heavy pots. I'm so glad I wore it because it supported my back, but it stops at the waist. Um, so the skirt's there to pull it down and stop it riding up because that's really uncomfortable as well. So it's quite practical so that's the, really. Yeah, it is. It's really, really practical. And it support, you, you have to lift the bus very slightly just to get it all supported. And once it's in, you don't move. It's great. I've done, I've done archery in this. I've actually oh, shot archery in one of these. Um, 
it, it, it's a lot of fun to do it. Um, and I had full movement and it was able to do it. I've, I've ridden on a horse as well with it. It's not a problem. So that's the um, upper body petticoat and every single status would have worn it high to low across the 16th century. We even see early versions of them in the late 15th century. You can see how it's starting. The difference is, depending on status, is whether you're elite or whether you're poor. And it's the fabrics. So the elite may have silks and satins and velvets underneath everything else, not seen. Whereas the working class will have linen as that one is. That one's a linen upper body petticoat. It's linen lining, linen interlinings and linen um, top fabric and then a wool base. So that's the upper body petticoat. Then we have um, what's called the a pair of bodies. And this is the garment which most people will assume is a corset, but it isn't. And I have one of those as well. Sadly, it doesn't fit me anymore. I think it's in the wardrobe. It's horrible. So that is an effigy bodice. If I come right back. And this is the front. Okay. And I've got the back here. So this one is actually front and back based. It was just so I could get into it on my own because the original is um, was made for Queen Elizabeth's effigy, hence the name, on her for her funeral in 1603. And this one is he more heavily boned, um, and it doesn't stop at the waist. You have these weird tab things which flare up over the hip, but they don't allow you to cinch it in like a Victorian corset does. And the, the, the engineering just don't, does not allow it. So you've got, I don't know what the physics are on this, but um, you've got the forces. And if it goes over the hip enough, you can then start pulling in and actually cinch your waist down because I wear those as well. But this effigy one, you can't do it to that extent. It's just impossible. But what it is useful for is the other support garments, which I think we're going to probably talk about in a minute, um, which support the amount of skirts you don't want those amount of skirts around a fleshy waist. You need something to support it. And that's what this starts supporting. But it's totally impractical for anyone who's working in the field. One of the items most depictions of Shakespeare himself are known to include are what's called affectionately as those poofy shorts. What is that item of clothing called and what was used to make them poof out like that? So um, they're just a, a pair of hose. They're upper hose and they come in various um styles and they they change fashion through the 16th century so sometimes the poofiness is just at the knee sometimes it become it then grows and comes up to the hips so we have a couple of designs and one of them is the very big what we affectionately now call as costumers the onion hose because they look like a pair of onions around your yes, legs that's appropriate i'll search i'll start yeah. using that now okay <laughs> and they can be kind of the the top third of the leg so they are covering things a lot or they can actually get really quite quite small but puffy and barely covering anything um, and that's when you get a pair of canyons coming into their own like a pair of kind of the modern look would be a bike um cycling short oh, I see. Um, though obviously much nicer than that um so that then covers everything <laughs> so that's one style we have. And then we have what's called Venetian hose, where it's kind of full on the hip to the extent that there's a bum roll inside both legs to keep it out. And a lot of fabric is gathered in to the waistband. Um, and then they taper down to just over the knee. Um, and they're quite elegant, actually. The, uh, my husband has a few pairs of those and he really likes them. Very comfortable to wear. So I think of the bum roll as being something on a woman's dress, yes. you know, that goes in the back. But yeah, the, so men would have this for their to make their pants have that same effect. Yes, as well. that though it, for them it's probably more integral. It's actually stitched inside to keep it out all the time, rather than a separate garment you put on. Um, because a separate garment underneath a pair of hose like that would probably start dropping down and becoming rather uncomfortable to wear. Um, so if the poofy shorts are the hose, then what mm -hmm. are the long, I'm going to call them stockings, but I've seen portraits of people like mm -hmm. Sir Walter Riley. They have on these kind of thin yoga pant looking 
things that they wear under their hose. Are those considered socks or pants? Those are nether, uh, nether hose. So they're the bottom half and they are ah. actually a stock, more akin to a stocking. Um, and there are um, an early version of it was made from cloth. So you actually cut the cloth on the bias. Everybody thinks the bias was used in the 1920s. No, it was used in the 16th century to actually cut on the cross. So you get a stretch around the leg using the bias of the fabric. Um, and they were made of wool and linen and a sole was cut out and then it was stitched up kind of like a shoe almost, but very soft. And then a seam was stitched up the back. And some of these are actually um, got a hidden lacing at the back from the heel up to the widest part of the calf. So you can actually get your leg in, foot in without struggling, and then you lace it and the lacing disappears completely. Um, we actually have a 1525 fashion book that a gentleman actually wore, used to record all his costumes and clothing from when he was a child. It's a lovely little picture of him as a baby naked. <laughs> <laughs> and then he and he has a costume there with this stitching at the back. And once it's lit, it's stitched up, you can't, you, laced up, you can't see the stitching and um, it was actually recreated. So quite um, intricate, well, these, these yes. pieces of, of clothing. They yes. weren't, it wasn't just women that had these elaborate fashion yeah. pieces. What about hats and, all. what about hats and wigs? Would men have worn hats or other kinds of headgear as part of their day? Absolutely. Dress? Absolutely. Yes. Not a single person can be dressed um, and deemed decent if you don't have your headwear on. <laughs> We, we, when I do a reenactment, um, we used to have a bit of a joke that um, we could have a bath in public as long as we have a coif on, we're decent. <laughs> <laughs> That's the important so, bit. <laughs> yeah, that was the important bit. You must have your hair covered. But that doesn't mean your hair isn't dressed. So your hair as a lady would be dressed beautifully and a beautiful coif put on. Or as a working class woman, base, uh, a basic centre parting, hair down and the plaits up on the top of the head and then laced into your hair no grips no clips or anything like that it's just a tape which laces the uh, plaits in through the hair and keeps it there and I've managed to have that for about four days without having to take it down it was brilliant um, and then a coif just goes on top um, so we have those men can have coifs as well um, but often they'll just have a hat and the hats can be tall hats small hats got feathers on them they have jewels on them the wealthier you are the more decorative it gets so when we have these outfits that are, are quite intricate to get into and as you mentioned the the dress once you're in it you're staying there and the hairdo that can last for days uh, that combined with the general lack of of hygiene and regular bathing, I would think the the mm. lack of bathing would mean you wanted to change frequently. But then you have these costumes and outfits that are quite difficult to get into in the first place, making it seem like once you're there, you wouldn't want to change. So how often was it typical for a man or woman in Shakespeare's lifetime to change their clothes? Do they do they get dressed in the morning and wear that same outfit all day or would they change for different occasions? Again, it's it depends on your status. Um, and working class are probably going to have the same outfit and they'll probably have one or two main outer clothing. Um, one which would be their Sunday best be a bit smarter to wear and that sort of thing and there'll be their working outfits as well what's going underneath is that linen that linen is being changed every single day even by the poorest people unless you're really poverty stricken you're going to have plenty of linens because the women are making them you don't go to a tailor for making linen shirts um, and the reason for that is they understood hygiene the whole concept for a good housewife is she kept her linens looking absolutely pristine doesn't matter what your status is so that if you keep changing your linens um you're going to let get less body oils on the top layers if you're a working man you're probably going to take off the top layers anyway and work in your shirt and what's called a waistcoat um which then supports your hose and stops it falling down if you're a, um, a working woman, you're going to take off your gown and work in your kirtle or even your upper body petticoat if you're all private. As soon as you walk out of your house to go off to the market, you're putting on your nice clothes again to be smart and elegant. For the gentry and elite, 
you probably would be changing. So you'll have a sort of the undress in the morning, which would be more comfortable. You won't necessarily be as smartly dressed at that point. It's kind of the wear your pyjamas for breakfast type of idea. But it's a lot, lot, lot smarter than that. And then you're going to be wearing, if you're going to be a court, you'll be wearing court clothes. Um, so it's the it's the portraits we see of them, of, of these people. And then in the evening, you may change that outfit if there's some sort of event going on. Um, and then we're back into undress again in the evening. So they would be changing quite often. And the courtesy books are actually commenting that you need to be washing every single day. We've got a wonderful late 17th century book, which teaches you French. And there's a lovely conversation between a child and his maid, and the maidservant who's getting him up for school and um, is telling him, you need to wash your face and are behind your ears properly. Here's, here's the bowl of water. And he's trying to protest to do it because he's a child. <laughs> and it's just wonderful seeing that. So that's a whole nother um, discussion. <laughs> nice to know that the children protest the bathing for centuries. They did. As, as they a mom, certainly did. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so when, what happened then at the end of the day? We've gone through the day and now we're back home yep. at night getting ready for bed. Would Shakespeare have had a nightgown or some kind of house coat that was an informal evening outfit that he wore in the privacy of his home? I'm thinking of items similar to the dressing gown or a smoking jacket or house coat that we have today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you have your linen shirt or smock, which is the daytime wear, but there'll be a variation of that for night wear to swear in bed. And then there's these references to actual nightgowns, which we know are not made of linen because the descriptions of them are these sumptuous velvets lined in velvet or lined in fur, and they're being worn as nightgowns. And they're loose garments, probably being worn exactly in that scenario, sitting down with a candle, a little bit of um, supper, and a book to read or something like that. Um, it's where you're not having visitors seeing you. You're in kind of the jeans and T-shirt in the evening. But as I said, much smarter. Um, whether the working class have got something similar, we don't quite know because the inventories don't always imply what they've got. Um, if they've got anything, it's probably just in something linen or wool, just wool something. Um, or they're probably just staying in their outfits until they go to bed and getting changed. The lining with fur or with velvet sounds hefty to me, but then I live in a very hot climate. I think we have to remember yeah. England gets pretty cold at night, and this is before the advent of things like central heating and air. So that was probably as much practical mm -hmm. as it had to, it sounds comfortable to like you're, you're walking around in your yeah. blankets, essentially. Yes, absolutely. The other thing um, people would have been wearing, particularly men, um, I, I referenced that they have coifs. There are particular type of coifs which have been created, especially the late 16th century, which are exquisitely embroidered. Now, women have these, but men have one which kind of looks like um, just it's just like a skull cap with a turn up cuff almost rather than a brim. And these are embroidered. These are lace trimmed. Trim. They have um, what looks like um, modern sequins, but they're flat pressed gold or silver with a hole put in them called O's, O-E-S, which then you stitch on to make this sparkle in candlelight. This must be exquisite. Um, some of them are just made of silk. Some of them are not. And I would be absolutely certain that Shakespeare would have had one to keep his head warm at night. That's fantastic. I know we would love to learn more about this topic and to explore some of these mm -hmm. portraits and different places that you've mentioned. Um, what are some of your favorite books or resources you can recommend we use to learn more about what Shakespeare would have worn as his undergarments? Well, the, the preeminent ones which I love are by uh, Ninian Michaela and Jane Malcolm Davis, which is the Tudor Taylor series. So Tudor Taylor, Tudor Child, accompanying books, Queen's Servants and the King's Servants, and they're about to come out with the typical tape, Tudor. Um, unfortunately, COVID has kind of stopped, delayed it a bit, but I'm really excited about that one coming out because that particular one looks at the working class up to the middling um, status, whereas the others tend to look at the elite to, uh, to wealthy middle class. So I'm really excited about those ones coming out. The other ones I've used, which I used before Tudor Taylor came through, 
um, were the Janet Arnold Patterns of Fashion series. So the, the first one is the Patterns of Fashion 3, which is a cut and construction of clothes for men and women, 1560 to 1520. Um, then they've, they've managed to, uh, a school of historical dress who holds, holds the copyright for her work, they've been able to use some of her notes and created Patterns of Fashion 5, context of bodies, stays, hoops and rumps, which is looking at the support structures being worn. And we've also got the shirts version, shirts, smocks, neckwear, headwear and other linen accessories, which is Patterns of Fashion 4. So these are all, um, these are my favourite costuming books. These are the go-to ones I have. These are excellent resources and we will link to these websites in the show notes for today's episode, along with pictures of some of these items of clothing that you can really get and see some of the descriptions that we provide in the show today. So make sure you go to the show notes to find all of those. Now, Bess, we ask everyone this next question here at That Shakespeare Life, and that's what's the one book you would take with you on a deserted island? My friends in England tell me I'm supposed to allow you the complete works of Shakespeare and a copy of the Bible. So your choice would be in addition to those. So the book I, I would actually take with me is a fictional book, is a fictional account of Queen Elizabeth's life. Um, and it's it's called Legacy by Susan Kay. I've read a lot of books um, which purport to show Elizabeth's life, but this one, it's a mystery, it's a thriller, it's a love story, and there's a supernatural element. But at the heart of it is a story of a girl facing life against all the odds, despite her high birth, in a time where the mere thought of a woman on the throne was unthinkable. I love the minutiae of life at court. I love that the descriptions of clothing, the environment and all the situations feel real, but don't detract from the story. That is probably the one book I'd want with me. That is an excellent choice for sure. And we will link to her Desert Island selection in the show notes for today as well. So you can find that there. So Bess, what's next for you? What are you working on now that you're excited about? Um, well, I, 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 though I've done 16th century costume for 25 years plus, um, I have branched into other costume areas. Sadly, due to COVID and because I'm um, clinically vulnerable due to a respiratory condition, I've had to literally shield for the entire year. So all my reenactment is stopped for 18 months. Um, if I'm fortunate, it might come back in, de in December. Um, there is a Victorian ball in October. So I'm going to be making a Victorian ball gown which I've been it's my latest wish list opus magna gown um so oh, it's wedgwood so blue fantastic. wedgwood blue velvet satin lace the lot um oh, so beautiful. yeah you'll have to send us pictures when you get that put together we'd love to see how that turns out thank you so much best children for being here and talking with us about Tudor undergarments this has been a fun conversation thank you thank you very much don't forget that the video version of our show today, where you can see some of the original garments Bess talks about today, along with the garments she brought with her into the studio for this episode. You can see them on camera, as well as the portraits we reference as examples for the Tudor clothing we're talking about today, all inside the app. The video version for today's episode can be found at CassidyCash.com slash app. That's CassidyCash.com slash A-P-P. I did mention that some of the questions submitted for today's episode were sent in by members of That Shakespeare Life. That's just one of the benefits of being a member here at That Shakespeare Life is you do get to participate as a producer on the show. You get to see who the guests are that are coming up next and submit your questions that you would like to be asked as part of the interview. Find out more about membership and sign up to submit your own questions and help us build That Shakespeare Life to be even better right here at castycash.com slash join the club. That's castycash.com slash join dash the dash club. Click that link to find out more and I'll see you inside. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening. I'm Cassidy Cash and I hope you learn something new about the Bard. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.